join me in welcoming Dr. John McGurk. Thank you, Zachary. Um, <clears throat> Now, there's always a design fault with lecterns, which this one has sorted out. There's nowhere to put water, but luckily there is, because I'm sort of recovering or trying to fight off a cold. So um, if I uh, dry up, um, I'll be able to get my glass of water. Um, I'm having a massive light shone right in my eye uh, as I look that way. Is there any way our AV people could possibly tone that down? Um, so, um, or else I'll be genuinely, not metaphorically, a rabbit caught in the headlights. For once. So, you know, I'd basically uh, head up CIPD Scotland and just a little bit about CIPD, if you don't know, is we're the HR and professional, we're the professional body for HR and learning and development. We have about 137,000 members, um, mainly in the UK, but increasingly worldwide in countries like the Middle East, uh, areas like the Middle East, obviously, places like the Far East. Um, and in Scotland, we have 10,000 members, which is why I'm here to head up with my colleague um, at the moment, um, my only colleague in full-time position, uh, Lee Panglia, who's a market development director, who's uh, head, she will be a director one day, I'm sure, um, who's sitting there. And, uh, you know, we are basically about um, building the HR profession um, and the learning and development profession in Scotland. So I'm, I'm taking a reprise back to my research background to talk about talent analytics and big data. Now, it's not often I'm cast in the role of orthodox kind of, um, you know, uh, person. You know, I'm usually quite unorthodox and quite challenging about practice, but compared to David, I'm going to give you a fairly um, orthodox, I suppose, but hopefully um, insightful um, approach um, to talent analytics. So the first thing um, to talk about is the expectations have changed we used to be in what I call a low def world, you know, low definition, um, you know, and that's a world that I grew up in, many of us grew up in. We're now in a situation where, you know, perhaps we might have loved this kind of thing, you know, this kind of, you know, pixelated image, um, but now we demand this kind of thing, you know, we demand much more definition, much more sharpness, higher production values. And in my day, as a, when I watched Batman, I used to be happy with that. And then when, you know, eventually they presented us with this, I thought that's so much better. That's so much more, you know, detailed and fine grained and high definition and all of that kind of stuff. So we're living in a kind of high definition world. Um, Ten years ago, um, the situation with IT um, versus HR, because one of the issues that we got to discuss in this project, which we conducted with Oracle, who sponsored the research, was you know this um, link between you know HR and IT. Um, so ten years ago, IT was a kind of unapproachable citadel, um, and you know sort of it was very inaccessible, hard to get at, etc. And, and HR was a bit like that. Um, and I often rail against that, you know, the kind of fluffy bunny thing, etc. But you know, if we go with the analogy, and then we see what it's like now, increasingly. The Citadel is being sort of, you know, stormed, challenged. IT has been asked to share more data with more people in the organisation, being held to account more to make business impact, as HR has been. Um, and, you know, part of that is very much around people data, um, which is why HR has grown some teeth, yeah? <clears throat> so, um, after that scary bunny analogy, um, a more serious issue around, you know, how we connect with technology. So this was a protest in 2005 um, against, you know, policy in the Middle East and Washington, I think. And, uh, you know, if you fast forward to 2013, um, it was being filmed by everybody, you know. So this whole issue of how technology is becoming, you know, the sort of way in which we mediate our world and the way in which we actually um, connect Now, Andy Campbell from Oracle, who's you know, one of the human capital directors for Europe, is uh, basically um, a rugby fan, and he knows I'm a football fan, or a soccer fan for our American and Canadian colleagues. Um, so he decided to, to use a rugby um, analytics um, sport analogy. So that's a rugby player, I know that much. I think it's Ronan O'Gara, possibly. 
Is it Brian O'Driscoll? There you go. I knew he was Irish. And, and I don't know if he's still playing for HSBC. That's the team, right? <laughs> no? Okay, right. Um, but I suppose the, the key thing is that he's got a device on the back of his shirt called Catapult, which allows his performance throughout the game to be monitored. And many of you will be aware of this. And one thing I would say to people that are either bored or scared of data and analytics um, is to pick, pick your favourite sport, whether it's netball, volleyball, rugby, canoeing, badminton, squash, table tennis. You know, any sport will have a lot of analytics around it. There'll be some geek somewhere who will have basically made it their business to overanalyze that sport and take all the fun out of it. No, to actually um, provide, you know, those analytics that allow people to watch it with renewed, uh, richer interest. Um, and football is probably, and, and David talked about the Germany World Cup thing, um, the fact is that, you know, there are lots of people who think that because somebody wears Google glasses that somehow their team is going to get a competitive advantage, but if it's a team of rubbish players um, with a fairly poor manager, it's not going to make any difference what technology they use. And that's an insight for us in HR and people in learning as well. Um, so this whole issue about sports analytics, I think, shows um, how performance has been analysed in the contemporary world. And if you move from, you know, the fairly frivolous world of sport, I suppose it's not life or death, to life and death. And uh, this guy here, Michael West, is a professor um, of work psychology at Lancaster University. And he is basically, um, he was in charge of a, a survey, um, a major research um, sort of project which used panel data um, which was longitudinal so it's a kind of um, it was also peer reviewed um, it, was a, it was a fairly high standard of academic research and uh, he looked at how um, teams in the NHS and Britain's healthcare service actually delivered patient care based on their team formation and team alignment and what he found was that those teams that had more genuine engagement that was non-hierarchical, so where the clinical director who might be a consultant or a nurse was actually connected with the cleaners who were responsible for ward hygiene. What he found was that they had lower mortality than the ones that had a very hierarchical form of engagement. So that's life or death, you know, higher mortality, and that is evidence. And that shows you the kind of insight and research that's out there. <clears throat> So moving on to what the issue is for HR, so um, in terms of the impact, um, about 58%, roughly you know, 60% of CEOs are concerned about a talent gap in terms of analytics. Um, about 29% think they couldn't pursue a market opportunity, and you can see the other stats there, about a quarter um, cancelled or delayed a strategic initiative. So there is an issue in terms of that research, um, which comes from PwC. Um, around um, the availability of analytics and data insight. Um, when you look at what's critical for executive decision making, and you know, David has come on to something which I'll talk about shortly, the, the suspicion of talent analytics, but certainly the CEOs um, want to see more predictive data. Um, they're, they're getting probably a bit of data on trends and scenarios, but they're not really that interested in the rear mirror backward looking data which we tend to overuse. So that's a big challenge for us. And in terms of uh, the, the workforce insights that we're generating at the moment, and this is from IBM's survey of chief human resource officers, um, you'll see the most important um, Data is, is the stuff at the end under the CIPD Scotland uh, symbol, which basically shows that on average about 10, 11 percent are doing things predictively. Most are looking at historical trends and patterns, or doing it simply to produce reports. So it's mainly transactional. Yeah. So we're not getting that predictive, game-changing insight that we need, um, and that's across everything from employee engagement, performance and management evaluation. Slightly better on issues like sourcing and recruiting, um, but obviously a big gap. In CIPD's own research, our HR Outlook, which we conducted in 2012 um, to inform this research, um, shows that there's a big perception gap between what HR leaders think they're doing 
and what other business leaders think we're doing. So roughly, you can see that um, in terms of using data um, to inform business decision making, about half of us think we're doing it roughly, sometimes up to about two thirds, and only about a third of business leaders think we're doing it. So that's a major perception gap in terms of what we're doing. And as you look at um, how analytics are changing, so we've had waves of business analytics depending on the nature of the economy that we're in. So we've moved from the finance and logistics, still very important, um, through to the customer and marketing data. And um, we're now getting to the issue of the business focus, the business data fixation, if you like, is around talent and leadership. And, uh, and that means the HR is firmly in the sights of CEOs and business leaders to provide that kind of insight. And if we don't, other people will. You know, that's the, the reality. Um, so we need to get better at it. So there's been a change in focus. Um, we're trying to move from being reactive to being proactive, from being transactional in the way that we collect data being, to being strategic. I'll talk about what that means, from structured data to unstructured data, so from you know, the kind of you know, headcount, turnover, absence type data, to checking out what, what's happening on LinkedIn and Chatter and Twitter and stuff like that, to capturing conversations um, as much as we can without using GCHQ, I suppose. You know, um, the whole thing is that GCHQ is Britain's spying agency headquarters, by the way, just so that you know. Um, the issue is that we need to get better at using unstructured data and we need to go from producing reports to asking more questions. You know, there are more questions that we need to ask out there. Um, and you know, the centrepiece of this um, particular presentation is around um, our research on talent analytics and big data, which I'm focusing on largely, but we're also, I'll also talk about what we're doing with our valuing your talent research which is trying to lift the insight level further. So there's, there's a couple of um, dimensions, or three dimensions to how we use data at the moment. The first thing is around silos, right? So a lot of the data in HR is in silos between different departmental and business unit walls. So we've got rewarders get data, um, learning and development have got data, uh, employee relations have got data, you know, you've got different business units have got data and quite often they don't join up at all because there isn't a data mindset in the organisation generally, except in the very large organisations and even then it can still get siloed, yeah? The issue of skills, so there is a, there is a, a problem and a concern that we identified in the research. Um, who does this? Um, generally what's happened is HR has cobbled together people that they think are reasonably good at numbers and are reasonably interested in it. And then they've got to make massive big projects and they've brought in people that would be sort of colloquially known as rocket scientists, generally natural scientists, um, physicists, engineers, etc., cetera, um, who come in and basically build a big data set and have massively numerate um, skills and then effectively only they understand it, yeah? Um, they, they often can't necessarily communicate that outside without it being massively mediated. So what we need are actually what we've termed aligned analysts. So we need people that can actually build that insight. We'll talk about how we get to that. And there's also an issue about mindsets, and that's what David, um, I think, very um, cogently put to us in the first uh, talk. Um, so there is an issue around you know, mindsets that were suspicious of too much data, that we think it kind of takes the magic out of what we do, that we think that it effectively um, leaves us dependent on a kind of reductionist thinking around how people perform. Um, and that's something that we have to be aware of because it is there. I've found that in a lot of the research. Um, <clears throat> in terms of silos, you know, there are structural silos, you know, so there are silos between departments. There are also system silos between the type of programs and software um, systems that are used um, and there's everything there from you know basically on the system side incompatible technology permission problems IT skills issues and legacy IT systems so all of these issues need to be looked at 
In terms of skills and smarts, um, there is an issue that everybody, some people need to have deep skill in talent analytics, but everybody needs to be smart at it, yeah? Everybody needs to have some level of what I call shallow cleverness. They have to know what's going on, or else they won't be able to make good decisions or support good decisions. So, you know, we can tap our existing analytical capability, we can build out skills initially, um, and we can develop centres of expertise with direct engagement in HR teams working on HR issues, and those would tend to have more specialists in them. Or we can buy in and build, you know, we can do different things, um, but one of the issues that we really need to do is hire analyst talent and encourage early involvement in key programmes, um, integrate and align capability and source um, integrated platforms and technology. The technology stuff, I think, you know, obviously Oracle understand deeply the technology stuff. We understand the HR and people side of it. So, you know, together we've been able to come up with some insights around that. Probably more difficult is the suspicion and scepticism. So, you know, the idea that, you know, Generally, the, the suspicion of what we do with data, that's an important thing. So business has got a suspicion of what we do in HR with data, that it's backward looking, that it's insular, that it's fairly simplistic. Um, some of them believe that we have a preference for ambiguity in the big picture over analysis. Yeah. So we, we have to understand that. And there are conflicting demands and expectations of organizations and the fears that I've already talked about dehumanising, and also an issue of an expectation treadmill. So if we do this once and we do it well, we'll continually be asked for it, and we might not be in a position to deliver it with all our other workloads, etc. Um, and we're dependent on external capacity. Now, um, you, we talk about talent analytics and big data, and I think one of the most insightful pieces of Research on big data comes from Gartner, um, so I'll share it. It's about volume, velocity, and variety. It's about the fact that every second more data crosses the web than was there 10 years ago, and that fact is already out of date, you know, because of the massive um, flow of data that has um, increased since then. Um, and, and velocity is the speed at which it's been transmitted and the, the dimensionality at which it's been transmitted. And the variety is the fact that it's in everything from, you know, washing machines to heater controls to, you know, the, the so-called internet of things, you know, um, to rugby shirts, to footballers' boots, you know, it's in everything. So data is coming at us in such a, a streaming volume um, that, that that three Vs gives us an idea of how to look at it. So looking at some of the strategies and solutions, so... The first thing is, looking at it transformationally, um, the first thing is to make analytics a continuous project. Um, focus it on key business priorities and don't get involved in sort of doing it as a kind of makeshift piece of work. You know, make it part of what you do and what you bet into the organisation. Um, and also, in terms of tactical, in terms of building the skills, um, you know, we need to develop these aligned analysts and I think those are increasingly going to come from the social sciences rather than the natural sciences, yeah? So we need to attract more capability from HR and OD, cognate areas like psychology, economics and anthropology. One of the best analysts in human insight around is an anthropologist, Gillian Bell. You know, because when you look at deep cultural issues and you're able to put numbers on them, you can get real insight. Um, and the other issue is that as we develop this stuff, so that we don't dehumanise it totally, but I, I take a lot of the points that, that David is making, um, we don't just churn out reams of data. We try and take the story and the narrative out of the picture um, and present it well. So we make stories from the stats is how we kind of label it. Now, um, <clears throat> I just want to talk briefly about our valuing your talent research because that's us in CIPD going a step further. What we're saying is all of this stuff is really important but we're not doing it well. We've had a lot of failed and you know um, half-baked initiatives on human capital in the UK and um, possibly the US and, and uh, North America, parts of Europe are in a slightly different place but generally in the UK and this probably applies to Europe, we haven't actually got it at the heart of value creation and you know, you've probably heard 
countless times the um, increasing uh, value of intangibles in company balance sheets and the most sort of fungible, if you like, intangible is um, people. Um, and you know, if we don't actually measure it properly, then we're really going to lose opportunity. Um, we're going to lose insight. And that's why we've got together with organisations like SEMA, the accountancy body, the Royal Society, which is a, a very sort of forward-looking research institute, um, and uh, the UK CES, which is the UK Commission for Employment and Skills, to look at this. And we've, we've looked at you know, the whole issue of trying to get a new metrics and measurement roadmap to help define a new era of human capital reporting. Um, and the fact is that there have been major strides made in the accountancy profession in recognising people um, as an ongoing intangible asset. Um, and, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of work around that. And if you go on the CIPD website, you'll see the stream of work that we're rolling out on that issue. Um, so, you know, that's basically, you know, where we've got to in terms of understanding talent analytics and big data from the point of view of the HR profession that use it. Um, we've also, um, I've also introduced you to our Valuing Your Talent initiative, um, which is about trying to lift the game um, and trying to get something much more strategic going on. And uh, the real challenge um, for HR going forward is now dealing with these issues that, that David has brought up, you know, the issues around, you know, how do we engage with data, big data ethically? Um, how do we start to really evaluate evidence? And already there's, there's a lot of criticisms that a lot of big data um, analysis actually, you know, effectively breaks one of the cardinal rules of statistical evidence, for example, by confusing correlation with causation. For example, um, and there is um, a lot of uh, you know concern um, amongst academics in particular that we're possibly using very narrow data sets and extrapolating far too much from them, and that the people who are trying to convince us to use these data sets are people that have got an interest in is using those data sets for their commercial purpose. So we've got to be alive to those issues as well. But the issue I would leave you with is the possibilities for people insight from using both um, talent analytics um, more thoughtfully and being aware of the big data dimension, building your teams to do that and building it into the whole mindset of HR is, is an opportunity that we can't afford not to take. Thank you.